many, many years. Okay. Yeah. 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 It doesn't feel right. It didn't realize that as much as it was. That's how we met. When we were 12. Yeah. 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 Can you hear me down at the table down there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Oh, that's good. I'm 
research with record number of young people in our summer enrichment programs, over 100,000, the first time in history, or the one time infusion of additional uh, money for summer services for middle school youth. Um, so, but there are, uh, there are tons of things. But one event I think that I found the most interesting, and it's a hopeful uh, of a partnership we're going to start with the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment, late mid August, I think it was. Uh, the mayor's office, uh, Commissioner Lopez, reached out to us and wanted to co-sponsor an event with the uh, technicians and behind-the-scenes crews of the Netflix of show Daredevil. And so we brought 250 young people and exposed them to potential careers in the film industry. You know, whether they be stunt coordinators, whether they be cinematographers, uh, and it was a packed house. Uh, we pulled together in two weeks. Uh, Sandra and her staff got a lot of the workforce programs involved. And we targeted uh, young people 16 and older. So we're, we're really doing some interesting things. Uh, we're making some wonderful partnerships with other city agencies, something that uh, I've really tried to focus on during my tenure. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them uh, either during the meeting or afterwards. But uh, and if you have time, you can walk around and check out this space. Uh, as I told a few people before the meeting started, uh, we, we were being evicted from 156 William. The space at 2 Lafayette was not big enough. So this was spillover space our staff found. And this was an advertising firm called Global U, an African-American firm based in Michigan that made a lot of money on a Chrysler Cadillac commercial. Moved east, didn't do so well in the second Cadillac commercial. Moved back and left their furniture. So um, no city tax dollars were used to do any of this renovation. <laughs> So please don't throw any rumors. Um, Christ, it did get federal tax bailout, so I'm not quite sure if there are any federal tax dollars. But you know, the old saying, someone else's garbage is someone else's treasure, uh, it's so true. If you walk around, you'll get the sense it feels like mad men. I mean, it, was a, it was an advertising firm. But again, welcome, and welcome back from summer. Thank you, Commissioner. So we're, we're going to move to the next agenda item, the community input discussion and this is something we really want to try to reshape these meetings we really want to find ways to gather community input um, from you all but also from from people who are using the services of DYCD and trying to figure out the best ways for us to engage with those communities because it's so important to get that kind of feedback on the local level so we're, today we're really going to start with a, our first conversation around this, and this is hopefully a series of conversations that we're going to have about how do we improve uh, community input um, possibilities and, and gather input um, throughout the year and developing this into a strategy that's incorporated in the program integration at, at, at the UICD. So I'm going to turn it over to Denise and Anthony to uh, lead us through the discussion. I want to just give you a little background on this. Um, some of you heard the commissioner talk about DYCD becoming the settlement house for New York City. And among other things, one of the conversations that Sandy and I have been leading the senior management team through is really what does that mean? And we had several leaders from the settlement house movement come and speak to us. We went to the presentation that Nancy staff did on a report that they've released in the past year on the settlement house movement. And part of what we've been doing is really exploring some of the principles in the movement, so, such as blended funding, one aspect of it. One of my personal favorites is called reciprocity, which basically means that everybody in the system can contribute to making programs uh, of higher quality. And so in exploring that from a funder's perspective, we began to think about how do we get input from different folks in our system or our orbit in the different aspects of DYCD's work, which pretty much break down to needs assessment, you know, identifying what the needs are. Of course, we use data that the city produces and, and have a presentation and all of that. Um, program design otherwise known as development of the concept paper and the RFPs. Um, as Anthony noted in our notes for this, you know, we get feedback from the concept paper to the concept papers, mostly from community-based organizations. And I wouldn't say many of those. I, I would hazard a guess 
if you would look at the feedback, it's pretty much the same nonprofit to respond to the concept paper. Program implementation, so once we roll something out, how do we get feedback from the users, whether it's middle schoolers, their parents, the principals who host about 90% of our after school programs, and then evaluation. I think we're doing a better job on evaluation. We hire really quality firms like Policy Studies Associates and American Institute of Research, and they go and survey participants. And so if you're in an evaluated DYCD program, we get feedback on the system. So really what we want to talk to you all about and what we're going to talk to the senior management team about is how do we get feedback in the other areas, in developing the needs assessment, uh, which is more qualitative, right? Not just the statistics, but qualitative um, feedback. How do we expand and get feedback from potential users to the concept people? Um, I was overseeing Sonic when we developed that, and frankly, we got feedback from middle schoolers after the design was already put forward in the concept paper. And they had a lot to say. Not always good. You ever want to get your feelings hurt? Ask the middle school what they think about what you're planning to do. Um, and so how do we develop systems so we can get feedback from our stakeholders who include potential participants, non-participants, um, which is one of the issues with the evaluation we get feedback from participants. So even while we served 100,000 young people during the summer, there are many more who weren't in a DYCD program. How do we hear from them? So we are kicking off this brainstorming, and that's very much what it is. We want to get ideas and then figure out which of those ideas we can implement uh, through DYCD going forward. So I'm going to turn over to Anthony to help um, lead us through this conversation. So if you look in your agenda, we have prepared um, some, some background questions and some framing questions. And it's really, you know, it's really just like what Denise said. You know, currently at the UICD, we are doing a community input. And what can we be doing to um, strengthen that, right? Um, so again, if we think about work in four main areas, um, identifying needs, developing programs, implementing programs, and evaluating them, now, we are doing things in these areas, right? So we just want to have this an open conversation here about how can we further um, incorporate community input you know, into our thinking and our programming and operations. And really at the end of the day, with the goal of strengthening and improving our programs even further. Um, and I think also as a means towards building upon our thoughts already where we look at communities as assets, right? So. You know, we recognize communities are our assets, so how do we further build on that asset-based thinking and approach? And I think the key thing that we've been talking about in some of our internal work groups is, given all the technology available today, smartphones, you know, applications, uh, how can we utilize technology to further incorporate community input? You know, for example, you, you, you can crowdsource ideas. You know, we can tweak something out, we can have people you know, tweak things back to us, or there could be ways to call for that. Um, so, you know, we just really want to open this conversation up and just get some of your thinking uh, on this, so. Can't see you there, right? Yeah, when we start by just coming on that we did, um, that we released a few months ago called the Settlement House Advantage was based on interviews with 3,000 actually adult participants in the settlement houses. And the, the only way you get somebody to complete a survey like that, which we, we worked with a professor at, at the Hunter School of Social Work to come up with the survey instrument, to come up with the, the questions, the methodology, and it was very helpful to work with her. 
Um, and is that the staff of the settlement housing team were trained to implement the survey with the participants in the agency. And I would suggest the same to you, that if you want to do, if you want to get people to actually fill out a survey, whether they tell you, orally tell you the answers, and a lot of the people in our agencies are not proficient with English. I mean, we, we actually worked with the Literacy, Literacy Assistance Center to make sure that the survey was um, geared to, a, I think, a sixth grade education level, so we weren't asking people to answer questions with words they didn't understand. But it really took the one-to-one -one, um, outreach to, to get people to respond. So I would just say, if you're looking for participants, especially young people, they don't relate to BYCD. They probably don't know who BYCD is from Adam. So it has to go through your providers or schools or some set of people that has a relationship, a pre-existing relationship with those young people. So you either sit down with them and fill it out for them, make them fill it out while you're watching, whatever it is. It's not like young people are going to sit there and do a, a you know, a six-page survey unless somebody really asks them who they like, trust, relate to on other levels. So, and let me just say that um, the uh, report again called Settlement House Advantage. I'm happy to. Bill, if you want me to, I can send it to Anthony to distribute to the members of the youth board. It's it's really pretty interesting. I mean, there are certain principles that we um, felt characterize the settlement house approach, and we tested those with the participants, and it turned out that, as you said, the sort of reciprocity and embeddedness, meaning embedded in the community for a long time, was very important community building, the whole strengths-based, looking at people and people with strengths, not with deficits. I mean, there's a lot in there, and so I'm happy to circulate that around. People want to look at it. But I think you have to, you, you as USCD, to get this information, must go through your provider agencies. Yeah. Oh, great. Can you project? No, I can project. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just to follow up on what Nancy said, I think that particularly asking participants and potential participants is extremely important. Those young people who are already engaged are already engaged. And so you have a captive population to follow through on some of the things that Nancy said. But I think there's another piece, and that's the ability to work with other parts of the city, particularly the Department of Education, in asking young people for their opinion. Um, there's very little that goes on, for, I believe, for most kids in our public schools that relate to leadership, um, helping young people become leaders. And those that rise to the top of that when asked in a school, who's interested in you know, planting in the local garden, whatever, I bet you, if you look at it in most schools, it's the same children who wind up doing that. And so to me, it would be wonderful to be able to work with the Department of Education, come up with a group of questions having to do with issues of the concept, not only what do you want to do, what's the structure, et cetera, and ask kids. I, one of the things I think all of us have found is that you ask a young person for an opinion, and everybody has an opinion very few young people have the opportunity to express that. And so I think that the idea would be around this is that part of it, when I said leadership, is leadership development. That's not what kids relate to. And depending on, as I look around at everybody's age here, depending on when you went to school, and I look at schools now, there are very few schools that have clubs. There are very few schools that have the ability for young people to be president of their blah, 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 blah kind of thing. All of those are leadership development. So I, I'm a little bit all over the place around this. My suggestion is, is to work with the Department of Education, come up with some very key questions that have to do with both content, how kids get involved, how would you like to be part of it, have schools identify young people, and the identification can be by lottery. 
And you know, if a kid says, no, I'm not interested, you move on to the next kid in the lottery. So it's not always the same children who, who rise up to that level. And do a round robin related to that. To, but first, you need to know what the questions are that you, that you um, want to ask them. Secondly, be very, very sure that there's follow-up. There is nothing worse than asking, whether it's kids or adults, a whole bunch of questions. People get engaged and get excited, and poof, that's the last they ever hear of it. So a second part of that must be some kind of follow-up and acknowledgement that this has, ha has happened. And the last to what Anthony said, it's extremely important to deal with the issue of technology. There are, are so many of our young people who, whether it's tweeting, whether whatever it, is, whatever it is of that moment in time, but it be in a controlled way. And again, there be an acknowledgement that we heard you, whoever the we is. So um, I endorse everything that everyone is saying. I mean, the first thought that I had is that it really has to happen at the, um, at the local level because um, if you want quality response and not just somebody walking in the door and saying something, a random off-the-cuff remark, I think that it would involve actually encouraging the, the, the community agencies to do this, when many of them do, have some kind of sounding board within their community as an ongoing structure so their participants are regularly giving them feedback and that you would then sort of like listen in on what they're saying. Um, number two, I think it, you, you, there's a lot of different ideas that are attached here, so you need to be, I think it's multiple efforts and for different purposes. So like the kind of survey that the Settlement Association did was like one kind of thing. You do that once every 10 years or something like maybe. You know, it, it's a different thing, like when you did the Sonic thing and you got the name. I mean, I think it would be great to incorporate survey monkeys and train kids how to use survey monkeys when you had quick little answers like that. It's a learning tool for young people. And it's, but that's a different kind of thing than really getting at the heart of like what is making this successful and what more can we do. And you could offer kids like different topics, but uh, of the ways they might get involved, but then what are the operational pieces about why we know teenagers generally don't come to a lot of these programs. It's harder to get teenagers and little kids because the parents bring them because they need to be watched after, but when you're 16, you vote with your feet. But what makes some kids actually do it and not do it? Like to get to the heart of that, takes more in-depth kind of discussion. And I don't think you can really centrally manage that. I think it's something you would culpate at the settlement house and then you could just visit. Erica and then Um So in terms of incorporating more technology, I don't know if it would be possible for the OICD to do something with developing an app. Um, because cities have done that before. The city of Birmingham and the UK actually has an app for the city council. And people are able to just you know report things like garbage pickup, um, just different things, but it's been really helpful for the city. And if the OICD had an app where, like, maybe students can sign up for different programs and they're already there, then we could have another section for, like, input, um, so people are already going to that app. And then another thought that I had was using Snapchat, maybe, which a lot of organizations do use. Basically, you just take a picture of whatever you're doing or a short video. And, um, like, if people were to take videos when they're involved in Sonic programs, like, basketball or doing, you know, different activities, if I encourage other students to um, get involved with the OIC program, you see how much fun everyone else is having. If there's a problem there because if they get an email or a text from DYCB, they won't have the slides idea of what DYCB is. 
if you're lucky, they're related to the nonprofit provider. They say, oh, I go to St. Nick's or I go to Henry Street. If you're lucky, um, they, some of them don't even know, like, if they say I go to the center, not even knowing who the nonprofit is who runs the center. But so I, I just think that they just have some, there has to be a way to bridge that gap. If the USCD is behind the survey, it still has to go out to some entity that the kid knows. Just, just a quick question, since we're talking about technology and apps. Um, we've been in the process of developing a new DYCD service locator tool, which is an online web-based platform. But Anurag, our head of IT, is very interested in developing other public-facing applications, and, and they could be apps. So um, originally, we were thinking about having a presentation today about that DYCD service locator website. Uh, when it gets rolled out, we're going to send it out to all of you and we want your feedback on it. So my point is that we are looking at these ways to use technology, but in terms of the specific recommendation about an app, I think that's something we still want to explore. So, but I think Liz and then Tom. Sure, just two, two thoughts. One is, um, I think Nancy's right about kind of getting the feedback at a touch point, you know, where you actually have the kid's attention. And a couple of things that we do, one of the things that my firm does is we actually pair up with community-based organizations and our volunteers are the ones who take the input. So we have iPads. It might be around the Thanksgiving. Families come in to get turkeys from Association to Benefit Children. So they're coming in already. They're a captive audience. But we're the neutral party. We're the volunteers. And we kind of get their feedback through um, input on iPads. So you know, just a couple thoughts is one, you have the kids' attention, they're already coming for an event, on their way in, on their way out, on their way in line to pick something up, a quick uh, um, burst of feedback might be good that way. And again, recruiting a neutral party, so if they don't like something, you grab a little bit of negative feedback or constructive feedback, and sometimes a volunteer is a good way to get that, that openness. Um, I was just going to suggest um, NYC College Line is something that DOE Key and community-based organizations have created to drive people to where they get college prep and readiness and application support. And so a lot of that, I think, again, to, to um, uh, echo what other people have said, like it might start at the settlement house that you turn the kids on to going to the site when you actually have them there. But it, then, it, then they could tell their parents or whatever. But it's a public-facing thing. But it's geographically like if you you could say, I, you know, I need help with financial aid form. I live in Queens. Like, who could help me? And it would drive you to a neighborhood center there. Or Can I just ask a question? Um, when uh, DYCD is funded programs that are in schools, is there a mandate that the principal notify all parents and children that these are the offerings, or is that left to the community-based organizations that are located there? For the most part, it's, to me, it's part, it goes to the community-based organization um, to notify parents and potential participants. Um, so when we have good relationships, the principal will send it out it also goes out to the PTA in, in all various um, aspects. I, I, I guess with that then, the reason I ask is because of parents I know around the city in different schools, and I say, well, gee, you know, there must be Sonic programs in, you know, from whatever Sonic. I said, why don't you, fi why don't you find out in your school? And then the difficulty that then came back, you know, we asked in the school principal's office and they had no idea. It's just, it's, it, it's not exactly what you're asking, but I do think that at a minimum there needs to be a relationship again between, if, if there, it's among DYCD, the CBOs and the Department of Education, to figure out the best ways to get the word out and not for it to be reliant upon the excellent work that a particular CBO does. But I know that that is a problem in many, 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 many schools in our neighborhood, so. I was just gonna comment um, that I think it's important to think about what kind of information you want from folks and um, recognizing the different target populations. So if we're talking about younger age population, you wanna hear from their parents. They're talking about, you know, high schoolers, you wanna hear from, you know, where you get where would you get that information? We're talking about older youth who are out of school, and the strategies might be very different. 
Um, and so an app might work for one group, serve uh, you know an in-person survey or focus group for another. And I think that you got to be really strategic um, about that and trying to figure out um, how you're going to get the information and why, right? Because sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for, right? <laughs> um, you know, and I heard um, Erica when we talked about you know getting folks to hear about programs and then want to take advantage of them. Well, the reality is there's a lot more young people who want to take advantage of programs than there are slots. Right, so we want to be careful in, in terms of how we're um, getting feedback and input. We don't and I think short short to your point, yeah. that's why we we need different input depending on what work we're doing. Right? right. So part of it is the needs assessment, yeah. so that we're not sitting here saying this is what the community needs or this is how it should be. So part of it is when we're before we do an RFP to identify the need. Then it's during the RP development. You know, is, does this design make sense? Right, to you. And for the most part, we hear from providers who may or may not, I don't know what they do to get that input, hear from potential participants or parents, and then it's the implementation. So how we're doing, you know, now that we put it out there, it is a meeting with that to continue. just say that it's very important for DYCD to uh, realize that um, the sample size to do uh, research, that we have, um, the sample size to do a small one or a larger one, um, with the different programs that went up um, with online strategies, that's a sound like a large sample to me. I, I don't know if that's going to be real validity in that. And validity is very important, so you have to think about that. The second one is the research of the best method. Like I was just saying previously, you got to pick out um, which research method is the best one. Um, like they were even saying, um, you got to pick out the parents going to be involved or just the one who's uh, the young people. And um, the last one, the lot least, but is the research program. When we do evaluation, um, I think a good program is we can follow. we got to find one that we can follow behind um, from the past research. Um, the Big Brothers program is pretty good with the evaluation and follow-up. Um, they follow up all the kids that they have that come in the program and after they leave. And maybe we can follow that model. I think, yeah, we're going to find a good model. strikes me is that you, you DYCD has such uh, a big network of relationships and I think if you're really trying to capture a broad range of organizations that you have young people that are being served by DYCD um, contacting some of those groups you know New York Immigration Coalition Human Services Council getting getting in touch with some of those groups because within the scope of those groups not only do you have some of the providers but you also have some of the community organizing groups that are really good at developing outreach strategies to be able to connect across uh, communities and get to different young people who may not be able to be reached in other contexts. And I've gone out with a number of those groups, uh, Daisy's Rising Up and Moving and, and The Point in the Bronx, and seeing how their young people actually are trained how to do outreach and to connect with other young people. So you're talking about networks of thousands of young people. And then I also think there's this other part of it around the faith communities. Uh, faith in New York is one of the, the, the larger organized groups in the city that have relations with churches across the city. And maybe going through some of those programs could actually be helpful too. But I think it's, I, I see this as, a, as a, a way to maybe build some partnerships between some of the organizing groups and the service groups that are in the same network.
they don't have somebody on staff who can sit around and handle it. They don't have the help. I think you should do that, they right? They used to do that. <laughs> a, a typical provider agency in your network does not have a policy analyst on staff who can sit, sit through and parse through the funding level or the structure of a, of a new program or, or an RFP or whatever. So I guess if you're looking for input, you just have, I, that's a structural problem that you have to understand, that most of these providers are pretty short-staffed, and even if they have people working directly with young people, those are not the same people necessarily who are going to analyze a concept paper. So there's a disconnect there. You're not going to get the on-the-ground people to do that. You'll get the UNHs and the PACEs and the Good Shepherds of the world who have that capacity to do the analysis. Towards that, and I think it relates to the point before about questions, right? I mean, there may be ways to ask different types of questions. There may be ways when we're developing a program, developing a concept paper, if we want to get input aside from just the usual suspects, maybe there's certain questions we develop for certain audiences, and you know, if, if we take those responses and filter it into our process. I mean, it seems to me that's what you're raising is something to think further about. It relates back to the questions of what do we want to ask? thoughtful about that. Be careful what we're asking for. So. Okay. Because no well this I think it's been a great conversation. So I thank everyone for their input. And um, you know really I think this is what this is what we want out of these meetings to have these types of engaging and strategic conversations for all for all of you. And thanks for everyone's participation today. So um, before I move to the next um, item I'll take any last our thoughts or comments on this one. And we will be following up and reporting back about <clears throat> ongoing steps here. So. And, and other questions so we really want you to keep thinking about this in between meetings and different ways that that we can all support the development of a, a strategy to give this community input and we're going to continue to do it at each quarterly meeting but we're also going to try to be in touch during in between those meetings and it, so it may be a phone call from anthony or from myself to just get any feedback from you that you might have so thank you everybody so we're going to move on now to the summary of the summer youth employment program, the job campaign. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Chris Lewis. I'm the, the director here at the U.S. some of our uh, plan expansion for the summer program in terms of our private sector jobs development. Um, and we've had uh, engaged in folks um, to try to reach out to your networks and for, you know, give us feedback in terms of uh, best practices and, and, and ways for us to be able to, um, um, for us to be able to uh, develop new and, and, and interesting uh, work, uh, 
work opportunities for each of these university programs. Part of uh, the model of our program has been to you know, a, a large subset of the job opportunities that we have, have available in some of the uh, uh, industry. So we wanted to kind of try to find ways to, to expand and, and, and provide opportunities for a variety of our, our young people. Um, we just wanted to give a, a, a quick overview on how the past so far in terms of this. Keep in mind that I will say these are a little preliminary. Um, we do have an annual assembly that's going to come out in the year, but we just wanted to kind of uh, give you guys something to, to look at as you want. Um, so, and a uh, uh, big shout out to our, um, our workforce analyst, Mr. Salam, who came up with this infographic for us. Um, and, um, we tried to get this down to, to one page, but um, there was a lot of information that we wanted to share. He did such a great job in kind of the visual aspect of this. So we Oh, okay. Here's the one page, and I was like, "Great, at this, you know, <laughs> great, at this. This, this, this is really great. Keep, you know, keep us more so. Um, you know, tremendous thanks to him for uh, getting this ready. Right. So, um, but I still have enough right when to get these in front of their face. So, to piggyback on what the commissioner mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, uh, we uh, USD as a whole has a, a record funding in to the tune of about six million dollars this year. Of that, uh, thankfully SYIQ was able to, to see some of those gains as well, um, reaching a total program funding of $79.9 million. Um, this uh, $79.9 actually includes about 71% of the funding, $56.9 million in CTL funding, which is incredible. Uh, CTL. Sorry, in city tax levy funding. So this is funding from, uh, from the administration and the, the New York City Council, um, as opposed to outside funding that we see via the state, the federal government, or private funders. So, um, you know, in previous years, our, our city contributions have been, you know, closer more or less to about half of the, the budget allocation. This year, we're, we're um, tipping over 70% of the program. So, it's, it's good to see that, you know, our local leadership has allowed us to serve 54, 54,263 young people this summer. Uh, uh, a record in a sense in terms of uh, uh, DYCDs uh, dealing with this program. And the, the high, largest number of young people served for some of you, including the days of our 2009 when we had an economic stimulus when uh, we were able to serve 52,000 people. So um, a, a tremendous, tremendous impact in terms of Year, you know, as part of the um, private sector worksite uh, development and worksite uh, development in general, uh, we were able to, to develop 9,056 worksites um, for the program. This is compared to 84, uh, 8,400 last year. Again, these are all, you're going to be hearing a lot of most and, and highest and, and, and uh, best ever type of tech comments as we go through this year. Uh, our payroll to date, this is money that has gone directly into the hands of young people. 53.9 million of the 79 million dollars that we have to work directly in the pocket of So this is you know, this is gonna be able to, to help these young people um, you know, purchase purchase clothes for for school or something. Say you know when you have when you have a program you know government doesn't be able to say that your your administrative base is so so small it's, it's really it's really a, a an impactful thing to say that you get to spend that many dollars in the vast majority of that you know, directly to the um, uh, Our Ladders for Leaders program, which is uh, a service option within uh, the Summit Employment Program that that's, um, provides uh, high level professional internships for for young people. Um, to the age of 16 and 21, we were able to serve 1,035 young people this year, compared to 475 last year, we were doubling uh, the service level for the large um, We're going to go a little more in depth um, into the ladders on the last page of the standout, and we should be right the same for the new one program, we're going to get into that. I also want to point out, point out our uh, vulnerability, this is another service option within the Summit program, that 
targets young people who are facing uh, extensive barriers to employment, including uh, being runaway and homeless, uh, receiving easy preventive services in foster care or for criminal justice involved. Um, last, uh, the, the mayor and the first lady tasked us with uh, doubling the service levels for this uh, particular population this year. And we were able to do that last year, we said 1,000 this year, this year 2017. to give a couple of uh, quick facts about the purpose of their uh, campaign. This year we had, uh, of the 9,156, we had nearly 3,000 private sector work sites um, on participating in SWP this year. That number accounts for 35% of all uh, work sites in, uh, in the program. This is up from about 30% that we served last year. Uh, and of those, uh, an increase of uh, seven times in Those work sites accounted for 17 different industries. And uh, as part of the campaign, we increased our our, set, our private sector sites by 754, which comprised 9% of all the sites. Uh, the second Just to kind of give uh, a brief uh, outlook by Sector. We need to highlight uh, six of our kind of key industries um, for the program. Let me know if you have a chance to see unfortunately, the countries have no issue with trying to find these kind of programs. But um, looking at uh, healthcare, retail, financial services, hospitality and tourism, cleaning services, and market population, um, this was the breakout for the video for the private sector of the sites in the summer. 353 uh, work sites in the healthcare industry, 267 in retail, 94, 78 in financial services and, and hospitality, respectively, and 60 in legal and 47 in um, So the year on year growth from summer 2014 to summer 2015, uh, as you can see, the, the healthcare and, and hospitality industries uh, essentially doubled.
modern school leaders, which was a program that served over a thousand young people. It was a tiny pilot that was born in this room, the yeah. Indian Court, not this room, but you know, across the street, um, with Indian Court Youth Council and the idea of a program called Capital. So some of you may remember it. Um, it was a tiny pilot of just 50 young people, and it's wonderful to see it grow and actually reach the university this summer. And um, many of the thanks go to some of you that were in this room 10 years ago and are in this room now, and so we continue to thank you for your support. Um, this was absolutely a better year for all of our employment programs, and a lot of leaders which served 1,000 to 1,000 young people this summer doubled its numbers from 475 the year before, but two, just two years ago, the program was serving 200. So this is tremendous growth. In, um, in a type of program that it's not easy to see. It's not easy to go to um, some of the biggest corporations that have participated and ask them to hire high school students or younger college students to give them a chance. Um, to give a chance to somebody who is coming from a city program, whereas um, most of the young people are coming in through internal networks as we learned this summer. So it, it's really, really tremendous to see um, had young people pulling together projects that you know kind of blew all of our minds. I spoke to a young man this year who he is working on an app um, for the website The Knot. Those of you who got married in the last 10 years or so may know The Knot. Um, he's actually coming up with an application that's soon to be launched which will help men propose. Um, <laughs> so, a very worthy cause for yeah, for the world, and it's good to know that one of our young people is actually contributing to that. <laughs> um, we've had 93 young people work in financial sector, from Newberger Berman to Bank of America to KPMG, Deloitte, um, it's been a wonderful year. Uh, we had young people work at 29 city agencies and um, elected officials, and those are some of the most fantastic jobs that we have. We had young people at Do It. we had young people at Office of Chief Medical Examiner's Office, and the, that is the most coveted internship that we're able to offer. Um, yes, you'd be surprised. Um, we had young people in cultural institutions, and really, all the dream jobs that you and I um, may think are out there, we were able to give the opportunity to young people to experience. So um, I thank each and every one of you who contributed and got the word out, and I think we have potential to double these numbers even more um, year to year, so thank you all. is a really small asset management firm, so we're very, very small. We've taken about 20 interns a year, um, and we took one ladders for leaders last year. We took two this year, so we did double it. It's a small number. Um, but most of the interns are, because we're small, they're clients' children. Um, they are employees' children. Um, it's a very sought-after internship. So we, but in terms of the program, the, the kids do debates, they do visits, um, even presentations in front of the partners about stock picking. So I called the head of the intern program to say, hey, we've got a new data. How did the ladders for leaders, kids do with all this you know, craziness of the summer internship? They said, the head of the intern program said, which ones were the ladders for leaders? <laughs> right. I don't know. And so then I had to call and say, wait, can we really get them in? And, and they did, but they just assimilated so well. And so the head of the program didn't even know who specifically they were. You know, um, just to build on that comment, uh, you know, the mayor made a big push, I would say, in May. He had a meeting with some of the 
top CEOs, I was at the meeting at Macy's, and so this huge growth in the private sector was a result of his push, the Mayor's Fund, the Center for Youth Employment, to really get the word out. And, um, you know, the point is so true, that every corporation has their own internship program, so I did a site visit to Pandora, and we had four young people from Ladders for the years there, and um, the account executive, Terrence Coulter, he was a big cheerleader for the Ladders for the Years program. He talked about how his first summer job was uh, working for police athletically when he grew up in uh, Brownsville in the 80s, I think. And he took me aside afterwards. He says, you know, uh, they have this own internship program called Roadies. Don't ask me why they call it Roadies. But that, and it's really their minor leagues. This is how they recruit their future talent. And he made the same observation. It's, it's a closed network. If you know someone at the company, if your parent works at the company, it's a friend, and which is great, but you know, there are 130,000 young people who applied. Many of them were college students who don't have these social connections. So part of what we're trying to do with the Ladders for Leaders program in particular is to be the connector, to open the doors that a lot of these young people wouldn't have the opportunity. And so um, we want to grow this program. The, the mayor has said this, and you know, this really came out of a conversation that I had and the previous commissioner had with uh, Kathy Wild, the partnership. She said, in typical Kathy Wild style, that uh, the summer youth employment program doesn't work for them. It doesn't work for big businesses because businesses, corporations, want to interview the young person. And so we created this internship program. We are, we're tweaking it. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the few programs that I've never seen where you had the left, the uh, Center for Urban Future praising it, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce no left-wing group there saying it's a model program. And so one of the things we got feedback from a lot of providers was we have to start the program earlier, which is what we did when, when Julia ran it. And so we are in the middle of uh, picking new providers. Uh, the RFP went out, it's due pretty soon, I think. Uh, we're hoping to attract groups like Pencil and uh, Futures and Options and other groups that are more uh, skilled in working with private sector employers and start the program in January. Because that's when college students generally start looking for internships. And we know from corporations, they start thinking about summer internships probably in the winter. So, but you know, I want to again thank everyone here. I mean, we set a modest target because uh, we weren't quite sure what this campaign would yield. And we said, I think 100, right? That was the number. So we blew it out of the water, almost 800. So thank you again. So are there any questions for the total participants, how did it compare to last year? Yes, so last year we served uh, 47,000 young people, so a uh, year and increase of about 7,000 participants. Thank you. <laughs> and easy to read, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to say thank you to all the private uh, organizations that are participating in the UIC and uh, the Latin programs, the Supreme Program. But I have a question. I want to know uh, maybe I'll help you. Out of all the participants that you love, how do you choose which one goes to the private organization? There's a separate application for a lot of Uh, there's a separate application that sort of piggybacks on the Summer Youth Employment General application. If you are 16 and over, have a GPA of 3.0 or above, are currently in school and have previous work experience, you're invited to apply to Matters for Leaders, and that involves a little more effort. Um, there's an essay component, uh, you have to submit your resume and a copy of your transcript, and you then go through really a qualitative screening. Um, it's no longer random, it's not a lottery, it really is based on your own qualifications. Sure, sure, absolutely. So that you know, the, while the lottery is blind, the actual placement process is not at all. And the the reason we actually changed in the last RFP, the pre-employment portion of the orientation, the education is now part of the pre-employment training that all SYP participants receive. But that's a time that the contractors get to know their young people, their strengths, their interests, and are, use that information to place them. 
Ladders for Leaders participants? It re it's, d it's dependent on the company they work for. Um, it's based on, yeah, some of them are getting paid, I, I would say maybe half are getting paid the prevalent minimum wage, which is not as bad as it was a few years ago. Um, but some of them are getting paid a lot more. More. There's been 25, 20, 25, yeah. By the employer, yes. Yeah, yes. Ladders for Leaders, the beauty of Ladders for Leaders is it's not mostly subsidized wages. We, we got money from Citibank, City Foundation, so about half of the 1,000 were subsidized wages, which were minimum wage. But the other half were the employers basically interview the young person and hire them and pay them. And that was the feedback we got from Kathy Wild, is that, okay, they don't like the lottery. They want to be able to get the cream of the crop. And we do a lot of screening to get them the cream of the crop. And they, we send these young people out on real life I mean, when we ran the program at DYCD, part of what the screen process was doing mock interviews. And I remember you know, interview, taking one afternoon and interviewing five or six young people and put them through the cases and then rating them. And then those that didn't make the cut didn't make it to the next level. So, because we know there are a lot of talented young people uh, who, who are in our programs and they don't have the connections. And so that's why we want to get the best, most job ready young people. So that's why. Uh, Ale Verizon took 25 young people. So part of the strategy in growing this program, and we're having a meeting of some of our government partners and some of you who were uh, involved in getting private sector employment later this month, is to begin to do a sector by sector uh, meeting so that the people who were in the financial sector can talk to their peers about what a success it was. The tech people can talk to the people, um, for example, um, I think Kickstarter. Is it Kickstarter in Brooklyn? Report? Yeah. You know, there are all these tech companies in the city, they should all be part of Buyers for Leaders. And they can pay the wages. Okay. Do you keep track at all of, to see if any of those private employers keep those young people up for after the summer? We do check. We do keep in touch with the employers and the young people. And typically, it's been an incredible 28 to 35 percent that are kept on. So, a conversation going on at the WIP. Um, is how to engage their members um, to really build out this program. So some of that conversation is around possibly the concept of a challenge of members for them to teach to be involved in hiring uh, people through this program. Um, but really something I'm pushing for and seeing how we find the best route towards this is it's the multiplier effect. So it's, it's nice that the members hire someone, but if we can go out to our networks and we can go to three to five people within our network and they can uh, talk about this program. I think that's where, where growth is. Yeah, we'll see growth. Is. Um, so that's the what's happening. Um, the other thing, of course, I'm going to make my pitch once again is um, uh, you guys did a fabulous job. Um, we had a much smaller program at the Department of Education, but through our CTE program, we had over uh, around 1,000 students placed in different sectors. We had a Bank of America program, which is kind of like your Ladders of Leaders, where we have a special target in IT and marketing. Same thing, we had seminars at Bank of America. The kids had the same kind of high level. So again, through um, David Fisher and the center, I hope that we will, and I know there are other city agencies that have. So, I mean, the thing is, like, so these people aren't hit up, like, if Verizon gets from the mayor, um, and the mayor's fund is funding us to do our work and yours too, that hopefully there can be a door that says, you know, give a kid a job through, and there's multiple efforts at the city, because we all want these to go together and not be competing against, you know, we too have advisory boards, we have councils like this, we have our connections to industry, and. So like to look at again, how can we align these efforts and work together and not not be in competition with one another because all these young people are the same, it's the same young people that we're all trying to help and you're absolutely right. Like there are so many bright talented kids and they just don't have the connections. And those are the I mean, that's an important group that we too are trying to so can I ask a follow-up question to that? Yeah. Is there some kind of coordination effort right now to well, we've had many conversations. We've just talked about in-school youth, and um, we, we started these conversations, and I think, you know, this is a conversation to have. Um, you know, one of my theories is to get some vendors who really want to particularly work in this area, maybe, and do some sector placements, which would pick up on our CTE programs. The kids are trained in sectors, so they have a lot of content skills um, by sector, and then maybe they can feed into these 
programs, and I know Andre and I had some initial conversations around one of the 9 to 14s, which didn't play out because of their side, but that there's ways that it could all fold in. And so Tom, I had a, a concrete suggestion. Of, there's a meeting here on the 24th, which you should attend. It's with a lot of the uh, government partners we work with. And out of that uh, meeting, it's supposed to be a monthly work group that will meet by phone right. to discuss uh, developing a strategy for employee engagement for next summer. And so we'll have SBS at the table. We'll have the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. So I'll, I'll have someone send you the calendar item. So it's going to be here on the 24th before the Pope arrives. Before you're out when the Pope is going to be in town. But don't forget, it's a Muslim holiday. Schools are that day. Oh, because so you can... Uh, <laughs> I'll be there. But, Our office is open. <laughs> but, but the thing about um, peer, um, peer uh, education, I think, is so important. So one of the things that I don't think they mentioned is that in the course of the summer, we got uh, contacted by Dan and John. Uh, were those old enough? Fubu? For the younger crowd, Shark Tank? I uh, made the mistake of mentioning Dave and John and FUBU and uh, to a group of 19 and 20 year olds, they had this blank stare, well, what the hell is FUBU, <laughs> right? So I, when, I, when I said Shark Tank, uh, they got who he was. Um, he reached out to us through a third party, the National Hip Hop Summit, because he wanted to be ambassador for a summer employment program. And so with the help of the Mayor's Fund, and uh, we, we picked in some money, we, are develop, we developed a public service announcement that we were going to be uh, sending out sometime in the next few months as part of a cam the campaign to continue to engage private employers. And he himself, I think, took his, his company, uh, Shark Branding, took, I think, one or two, in, one or two. They took two and they found somebody else in another one. Okay. And, and his first job was summer youth employment program in the 80s in the Parks Department. So he will be an ambassador to the private sector uh, as an example of Here's a young person from the neighborhood. You know, you would never thought he, he would have accomplished what he's accomplished in his life. And so, the more we can have other employers talking it up to their networks and their peers, I think that's the way to grow this program. Because it's not about money; it's about relationships. It's about uh, because the, the city bank money will dry up next summer for the last summer. So, for this program to be self-sustaining, it has to engage employers who are willing to pay the wages. And we can find the young people. That's not a problem. We have 3,000 young people applied this year. The last school year is still in place, 1,000. So, but uh, the time you should definitely be part of the meeting the 24th. Can I ask? I want to just ask the group of, in doing outreach to your different networks. What were some of the things that actually worked to engage people to to get people to to buy into the program? So I think we one of the things we do need is feedback around that that we can adapt to other networks. So what were some of the things that worked, or uh, what, what kind of materials do you need, what kind of, I mean, are there, are, there, are there other things that BYCD can do to actually help you as you do the outreach to your networks? I think a lot of it is the personal appeal. It's coming from someone you know, and it a whole lot better chance of that coming through. Otherwise, it gets lost in the noise and all the other emails you get and all the other requests. that unfortunately didn't work or that was tough was when I did my outreach, I did reach out to a friend at Bank of America and Jane Ford and these other places, and a lot of them do have already established programs. So I think we can still try to focus on the traditional uh, financial services, but it's really kind of those new uh, organizations that aren't tied in yet to this whole system. Because I, I unfortunately got a lot of thanks for reaching out, but we're already doing this, we're already doing that. But I think we still try. What's worked um, for a lot of already established programs is something like you did. You have 20 and you get just two, which is actually 10% of it, so which is huge. Um, but just adding a couple of jobs to the traditional program and kind of having them be a part of everything that's already established, that works really well. The other idea that came out of my conversation with the folks at Pandora was they saw the six-week internship program as a on on ramp to their regular internship program, the roadies program, because they recognize that there is a talent pool they don't know about because it's not in their social orbit. So that might be the other way to pitch it to when you. I mean, J.P. Morgan did come come on board this year, I think. Right? Oh, well, one. Uh, but you know, amalgamated, Kate had 25, right? Right. So 
So the way to pitch it to people that have established programs is to say, this could be an on-ramp to your, your more established Because it's only six weeks, and a lot of these other research programs can run three months. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.